I want to finish something that I've started four years ago in April, or at least around April. I think I made it a bit before, before I uploaded it. But anyway, I would like to finish it. And that is a wrought iron stake anvil with a forge welded on steel face. So we're gonna go back to 2016 when I still had the forge outside behind the containers and everything like that. Um, those, those of you who followed me long enough know this stage. So really things have changed a little bit. I don't have a whole lot of filming material from before and just a couple of pictures. So what I'm gonna do here is briefly take you through the begin stages uh, and point a couple of things out that I think that I've done absolutely wrong and that I don't do anymore. So if you're getting into forge welding and would like to forge something similar to this, uh, here are a couple of pointers that I'll give out that I think I was doing wrong or could have done better at the time. I spiked the bottom, I made a shoulder on it so it can actually sit. Uh, the top portion of it has been upset a little bit and I've created some, some lipping on it, some, some scarves if you will, that can be hammered into whatever is going to be forge welded on top because we have the main body on top of that I'm going to forge weld something for the horns and on top of that is going to come a tool steel face that also covers the horns. It's all made out of wrought iron the body and the top section is, is material that has been folded over on itself two times so you got three layers. Now looking back at it, I do think I've put in a bit of a weird shape. I cannot remember why I thought this was a good idea. It will weld. Uh, probably, probably some sort of way to work in the welds or some sort of nature like that, that I was going with that approach. But looking at it right now and knowing what I know right now, it's a method that you can definitely use because I made it work. Uh, but I definitely wouldn't do it anymore like this. There are very different methods better methods than what I was doing right there. In the beginning right here we already have three things that go wrong. Thing that goes wrong number one I'm welding outside in the open air with sunlight and that sunlight can really change the way you perceive the heat, the colors, the textures which you which can throw you off a little bit and that is what I noticed and that is what I can relate to right now when I was first forge welding on steel faces and the reason that they popped off it's much easier to be inside a building with controlled lighting uh, so at least that is consistent it makes it a whole lot easier. Thing that is wrong number two it is way too far away. Bring that thing closer. I'm, I'm welding way too far away. Looking back at it, I should have moved the anvil out of the way and then bring that switch block nearer to me because every you know, little bit, every little fraction of a second that you have to move a whole lot more around, you know, that is air hitting it and you're losing your temperature. Of course, uh, if you got the conditions right, you're gonna extend the time, but it is much better to keep it as close as possible to your forge fire within, you know, within reasonable distance so you don't burn up and don't set yourself on fire blah 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 but bring it closer and fault number three would have been better if that switch block was up a little bit it's nice for striking the height that it is in right now but for the application that I was doing it right now it would have been better if it, if it were up a bit higher for me so I don't have to bend over as much here you can also see okay it's a bit oh, it's orange again Never mind, so I look like the, the American president okay, here you can really see that my style of recording has changed because, you know, when you look at this, this is all very far away and this is what really annoys me. It's been, okay, I, I can see that I'm busy with forging, but I cannot see what I am doing right over there. You cannot actually properly see what is going on. You, you cannot see if it is going right or if it is going wrong. I don't think much was going wrong at that. I'm looking at my phone. I don't think much was going wrong at the time right over here, but you, you can just not see what is going on, so. Okay, then th that was the first video. Uh, I only did the beginning of that, so we're gonna go to that continued, it's actually part two. Okay, we got the beginning, I'm gonna weld something, I assume. Oh, right, that's the sides, I'm welding on the sides. I, I, I wasn't sure anymore what I welded on the sides, those, 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 those triangle pieces for extra material, or whether I left enough material in there, but I actually welded on, I can see here including the hat and some people have asked me about if I still wear the hat and what I do with it. I actually don't wear the hat anymore because of really two reasons. Reason number one, the way that I forge and the way that I move, that thing is not very tight on my head and it moves about. And because it moves about, I can feel it move about and it can shift forward and it can shift backward and I just think it is incredibly annoying. The second thing is, uh, particularly when you're doing some heavier striking and some heavier working, uh, e even normal striking, I tend to hit my hat. It's, it's not uncommon that when I swing the hammer that it actually brushes, you know, just barely not hits my head, but it does hit 
hat, which would then knock off my hat. So uh, those are two reasons I don't wear a hat anymore, at least not that style of hat anymore during foraging, because I just keep knocking it off my hat. I would have kept those horns a bit shorter right now, because the shorter and longer they are, or sorry, the, the longer and thinner they are when you try to forge weld that, they heat up much easier and, and, and much faster, and you do risk burning them off if, 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 if it goes wrong. If it doesn't go wrong, uh, the more they're exposed to heat and everything, they can oxidize a lot more. It's, it's just more of a pain. So in, in hindsight, make them shorter and thicker, and then draw out. I oh, had yeah, 10-pound hand hammer drawing that stuff out. That actually worked really well. I don't know where that hammer has, has ended up, because it, it's a really useful hammer to have, a very heavy hammer that you can use as a hand hammer. And then eventually once, yeah, once this everything has been, been forged, yeah, once this everything has been forged now, I do move on to actually forging a steel face. I made this out of some 1045 tool steel, uh, because that's what I had at hand. You flatten it out and then you have a steel face and then you form the steel face that, you know, is, is proportioned, contoured to the top of that anvil. Stake anvil, actually. I've looked around in the old footage that I still have, and I don't have the footage of welding on this steel face because I do clearly remember that I was having troubles with this. It was a pain to get on, to get the middle of the face to get on. It was even more of a nightmare when I was trying to weld on, you know, the steel face to the horns. That just did not want to get welded on. No matter what I did, it just didn't work. And I think I know why this didn't go exactly right. For one reason is the different fuel. Uh, at the time, if it's after that, and I think it's after that, well, realistic it's gonna have to be after that because in 2017 I was in France most of the time. Um, so what I think happened, coke, at least the coke that I can get here in this country, the low countries, the Netherlands, Netherlands, Piba, uh, when I get coke here, the, the, it produces quite a significant amount of clinker, whereas the bituminous coal we can buy here, the blacksmith grade coal, is actually very good. I was using coke at the time because, you know, I couldn't produce any smoke for the area right there, so of course coke or um, pet coke it is, but I chose for coke, uh, burned a little bit nicer, but coke requires quite some air to be forced through, particularly when it starts to form clinker. Particularly with a bottom blast fire, you know, with a fire pot and everything, when it's not very deep, if you get quite some clinker in there, you can actually push up the oxidizing layer where the oxygen comes in quite up quite far, uh, which is not good. I have to put in a heavier blast, so that means I get more oxygen even in there, so you get more of an oxidizing environment, very, very, rough on the iron and on the steel. What I don't really do anymore is when I apply flux, you know, usually it's applied at a red heat, put it in your fire, and then you take it and you, and you, and you do your welding. When it's, at, when it's at a welding heat, of course. Um, with these larger pieces, that can actually be too long, and I find that if you keep your, uh, whatever you're trying to weld, if it's big stuff, if you keep it in the fire for too long, you know, if, if it requires a soaking time, even if it's already at the right heat, it can require a soaking time. It can be too much. And the oxygen, whatever is in there, uh, it reacts with the borax, it reacts, it, 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 it does whatever it does and it deteriorates and it no longer does what it is supposed to do. That is one of the things that I'm fully aware of right now, that if I do flux, I want to do it particularly with the large pieces, is do it at a later stage when the stuff is much hotter clean it then, and then apply the borax, because then it actually does its thing. Whereas if I do it in the beginning, you know, particularly with, with large stocks, say hammer size, stuff like that, it just takes too long. It just takes too long. So, you wanna, so I want to apply it later and have much better results with that. It looks much cleaner. It, it's, it's got more of a cleaning action than if I, um, if I don't. Uh, and, and remember that the frustration is, is you tend to hit harder, whereas actually you should, you should go into the opposite direction. You should always hit, at least what I try to do, is always hit softly when you're trying to work that thing together. You don't want to smack the crap out of it and hope that it takes no. Don't, don't hit that hard. Keep tapping it because then you'll feel if you have a surface that starts to grip, and if it does grip, you can take another heat and then you can continue your welding rather than just beating it to death and then everything has deformed and is no longer 
you know, in the right shape. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to see if it can get it to weld. Um, I don't really expect too much from this, just because you know they're old welds. It's, uh, it's it's been rusty and everything. I don't know if I got impurities, inclusions, and all that stuff inside there. Even if I can pull it off, and it seems like the horns are welded on. We will not really know how good it is until I actually put it through a quench. I'm going to try and weld it. We're going to clean up the old flux and everything and see what happens. Get it stuck together, forge it down, um, then clean it up, take the angle grinder, remove some of the stuff and then do some additional cleaning up, maybe with a file. See what we end up with and then the important part comes and that is going to be the quench. The quench is what is going to tell us if this is going to be a good thing or after all these years it's going to be crap still.
Now it's the scary bit. Well, it stayed on there. Now, of course, the important question, has it become hard? Yeah, that guy's really hard. Yeah, there's a variation in it. I'll um, I'll bring it down to eleven seventy five. So that's the steak anvil after a bit more than four years. It is far from perfect, it is perfect from far. It leaves a couple of things to be desired. It's not perfectly stamped, it is not perfectly balanced and perfectly symmetrical. Uh, not as much as I would try to make it if I were to have to remake the entire thing. I would also do it in a very different manner because right now with, with what I understand now and what I, what I have experience with right now is I would do a jump weld right on there and I would weld on this horn make it thicker though, don't have it end here, uh, keep it all shorter and fatter, that will work much better than if you try to do it thin because you risk burning it. Perfect lining and all that, you know, towards perfection, uh, it, it's got to be reasonable. But in the end though, I'm quite happy with it because I didn't think it would look like this. I would think it would be a lot more lumpy and so you can see that over time uh, the skills change, the perspective changes, and the way you approach things really drastically changes over time. It seems to have come out right, because if there's anything wrong with the welds, and there are a couple of welds in there, so we got one, that's the main shank and everything, that's one piece. We got the top sections, one piece, that's two. We got the two sides, which I welded on, makes it four, and then we got the five, or the, sorry, the fifth piece on top of that, and that's a steel face. If any of those welds really weren't on there correctly or not properly welded to some degree you would hear that, it would really change the sound.
I must add to this uh, before it, this turns into misinformation because it can turn into misinformation. The, the way a tool rings, you know, doesn't necessarily tell you how good it is or what the quality is, or at least what it tells you more about is the internal structure. Of course, you have a cast iron anvil like a Fisher Norris anvil with a steel face, that thing is not going to ring. At least I'm not aware of any of them ringing because they have a cast iron body with a steel face. This, however, wrought iron, it can vibrate, so can steel. And if the welds are good generally, if it you know, is well attached and the vibrations can actually pass through the welds, there's no movement in that where the energy is lost, then you will have a clear ring or it should have a clear clear ring to it that keeps resonating for quite some time. If it doesn't, then usually there is something off. There is something where the energy or the vibration can, can go to. Now, just because, for example, you have a quiet anvil, doesn't necessarily mean that the thing is broken. It could very well be that it sits in such a way that it doesn't ring anymore or that it is tight. Just for example, when I take my small anvils, uh, when I bolt them down to the stand, and that's only two M12 bolts, so two half an inch bolts, grade eight or grade 8.8. .8. When you tighten those down, it's only two bolts, the thing stops ringing because it, it's pulling it tight to the bottom. So if the bottom makes a good connection with whatever it stands on, you can already, you can already lose a lot of that sound, even though it could be very good. And you know, it, it rings here, but as soon as I hold it here, it stops. You can use it as an indicator, but not as much as, as a definitive answer to everything. There, there's a lot more to it. So I'm really happy with this result and it is finally finished. Uh, of course, I need to do a video later uh, where we're actually going to try it out, actually do some hammering on it and uh, work on the tip and see if the tip and everything would break off because that's the next question. Will the iron and will the steel that is on there right now, will it be able to take a beating or will it simply snap off? We'll find out in the next video. I would like to thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one.